um, to to adopt trailer bill language, including uh, portions of the governor's proposal, uh, specifically um, dealing with the acceleration and retroactive payment reauthorization, um, providing some additional savings within the fund um, to mitigate what ever need might be there to put general fund into it. Bottom line, I mean, the more we can minimize general fund repayment, the better. Um, so there is laid out, I think, a some programs that are less, not so much the core programs from which savings could be derived. Um, and, and so that the fund would be more sustainable um, as everybody's been concerned about. Uh, and um, for some earlier discussions today, members, I know there was one issue that everybody was kind of trying to figure out how to deal with um, to make sure we don't harm our the jobs that exist in our beer distributors. And I think there's a way to do that that really has to do more with cash flow when we do the acceleration. If we allow some dates to move, that it gives people a little flexibility to get prepared to deal with the acceleration issue. Is that everybody's understanding? at the moment. You okay? Finance? Or department, whoever, whatever. Sorry, I might, oh, I prioritized you, sorry. No, there you go. Uh, Madam Chair, Jason Marshall with the uh, uh, Division of Recycling. The, um, we, we understand the proposal to, to have the acceleration apply to the February reporting period uh, and be a statutory change as opposed to regulatory change that would bring in approximately $100 million at the end of April as opposed to what our estimate was on the regulatory current uh, state of play, which would be only $60 million at the end of this month. And um, we, we believe that for purposes of balancing the cash flow, as you noted, that that would, would indeed work for purposes of acceleration and bringing in revenue. Is there more than one piece to it, or well, that's it? We're also going to be two years sunset. Sunset? Is that on the acceleration? Is that the other? Has anybody talked about that? I mean, that's not, that's not what the administration would prefer. But that's I mean, the, I think the notion is that sooner or later this fund should get stable, and therefore if we sunset the acceleration provisions in about two years, not this year, but next year. Give us a little room to see if that's necessary still two years from now when hopefully we will have repaid the fund. And I'm not putting it in statute, but I do assume that the, um, I, I don't know whether we need to talk about this in sub again, but I also think at least publicly we ought to say for purposes of this fund, we expect CARB to be repaying their share of that repay from their fees as soon as possible and as quickly as possible. And Ken DeRosa with the Department of Finance. The Air Resources Board budget for the APCF Air Petition Control Fund does anticipate a payment, repayment to the BCRF of 21.3 in the 10-11 fiscal year. Good. All right, so just to reaffirm that publicly that we think that is an important thing. I don't know if we need to vote on that piece of your thing today. It's really a 10-11 budget issue, but um, I just, for purposes of making sure we all the, think this fund is basically moving and restabilizing and allowing people to continue to do what they need to do um, with this language and the understanding that at least that money will be repaid from um, you know the fee fund I think it gives us all a little opportunity to hope that we don't have to use as much general fund to um, as much as we admit that we need to repay the fund uh, when we can not using the general fund this year or using it to any limited extent possible, um, I think would be good for everyone. So, so did I see your hand up, Senator Huff, or you were just, okay. Okay, on that basis, anybody? Oh, Senator Dutton, sorry, I missed the. Well, did we, Elio, what do you think? Uh, Caroline Godkin from the LAO. Uh, we would, um, we agree with the analysis, the staff analysis on the proposals. Um, and uh, in particular, we will need to work this for the budget year, we may need to look at this in the, in the regular budget process, and we'll work with the department um, and the committee on that. So this won't have any real effect on what we're dealing with current year. This strictly is a budget year item. Has this been through? Part is current year. The, 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 the portion has, we're adopting today is current year. There's additional issues for the budget year, I think. Then I guess I'm confused. I don't know what what it is. I'm because it sounds to me like I'm trying. You're asking us to look at more than just current year. And I don't even think this has been through a policy committee, has it? 
I think we were leaving the larger issues the governor raised as policy issues for bigger. This was more, these were the governor's um, current year proposals. Some of it is needed to make the fund more stable now and to minimize the need for general fund backfill in the current year. That's kind okay, of the well, notion. Here's, I guess, my concern so. is, is that, you know, we've, how much money is owed to this fund? What, About 400 million, last time I looked. It, it, 519. 519 in total, of which 450 is from the general fund. Okay, and it's gone for purposes other than obviously what it was intended for, that was collected for, right? And so what we're talking about is trying to pay back $28 million. And so I, I guess what I'm I having a problem is we got a big problem here and we ought to be looking at the whole fix and not just piecemeal it. And this, once again, is just piecemealing it. Last year we had the same problem. They were trying to increase the deposit uh, the requirement and just so they could give more money to CARB. And I frankly just, <laughs> that, that actually insults me almost, but I, I think you know, frankly, I, I can't support a partial fix here. I need to hear the whole thing. And what's being proposed, uh, some of the additional things that are being proposed, we frankly didn't see it until last night anyway. So that's why I was curious if it had gone through a policy hearing, because I can't find anybody that's got anything about it. So I, I just need to look at the whole thing. I can't do it on a piecemeal basis, what you're talking about, so. Yeah. Senator Semedian. I, I see this as a, <clears throat> I don't even see this as a piecemeal. Uh, this is essentially an accounting device to afford us some relief, short term, temporarily. Um, I, I think there is clearly a much larger discussion which has been underway and which is not yet resolved and which isn't going to get resolved in the next week or two or three about how to restructure the entire program, get it back on a sound footing in a way that makes sense. And there are a lot of competitive stakeholders who have different views about what the best path might be. So I, 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 on the one hand, I agree with Senator Dutton that we, we have a lot of work to do, um, but I don't think we're piecemealing. I think what we've said is this is an accounting device. That's all it is. I think the chair has been very uh, wise to remind us that we ought to get this sorted out so that we don't have this accounting device in perpetuity, that within the next couple of years we need to get back on an annual track. Um, but I think uh, whatever you think that the global solution ought to be and whenever it is we're going to get there, I don't see that as having an impact on the proposal today to use the accounting device to afford ourselves uh, some temporary relief. Is it a solution? Of course it's not. Uh, is it um, better to bail a little water than to watch the ship go down? It is. That's kind of where we are today, and I think the Chair's got us on the right path. Well, I got one then a follow-up to that then would be the Governor already has authority to do repayment anyway. He was given that last year, wasn't he? Well, he doesn't give and is this more or less than what, I just don't understand what we're doing here because it, it seems like the governor already has the ability without us doing anything. Well, what, what we're trying to do, Senator Dutton, so, let me just answer that one. I, I think what we're trying to do with this, a portion of this was part of the governor's proposal um, and what we're attempting to do here in the modified version is to provide enough relief to that fund that hopefully the governor will not find that he needs to spend inordinate amounts of our general fund in the immediate um, in order to sustain the fund. So, um, you know, as, as much as we can minimize the general fund repayment, as much as we recognize that we owe it and we should, this year may not be the best year to do that. And some of these <clears throat> changes will allow us uh, a little more room for the discussion that Senator Semedian talked about. We did send a bill to governor last year, it was vetoed. And there will tend, there will be ongoing discussions in bill form, I'm sure, in policy committee, in subcommittee somewhere uh, about the long-term and budget year um, needs of this fund. But in the meantime, I think this will allow, what I'm most concerned about is it allows the programs to continue to function with some sense of stability in some order to their business and knowing what's available for them and it reduces the programs that are less core in order to sustain the programs that are core. I don't know about your district, but I've been hearing about the closed recycling centers and some of the things that have been problematic for businesses that have relied on this, glass manufacturers and aluminum folks and whatever. And so I, I think what we're trying to do here is just get ourselves in a place where that larger discussion can continue to, to take place. Well, I appreciate that and that's the reason why I was interested in seeing the governor pay more, not less. So because I was concerned about the same people in the same job. So tell me, is the, is the governor then, did you say that, are you saying that the governor wants to accept this modify, modification to what he's recommending or, or what's going on? I don't, 
I was confused about your comment about where, how this fits in with what the governor originally proposed. I think we, we understand the proposal conceptually, and to, to be fair to the committee and, and to the administration, we, we have yet to see some of the, the relevant details. We've just discussed this in concept. Um, a, as it regards you know, general fund loan repayment and all of that, we have to look at that in the context of, of how this will manifest in terms of additional revenues to the fund and some of the other things that are planned. So. It's, so you it's have no concept. opinion on it right now? Is that what you're telling me? Because you haven't we, seen all the detail? We understand it conceptually, but we, we can't commit without having relevant details. Okay, well, I guess we're in the same boat. It's hard for me to commit, too, because I also haven't seen it. And it would just seem to me I appreciate the uh, the arguments that are being made or the points of view, and I agree with a lot of what, the, what Madam Chair, you've said. But the fact of the matter is that, that we have a problem with the people that are affected by this fund being underfunded because we've taken money and we funded CARB with it and other, other organizations and other general fund purposes, and that's what got us into this problem. And so the longer we delay uh, solving this in the current year, that's part of what's gotten us into this mess anyway. So we won't be able to support it. So. Okay. That larger discussion will not be resolved in the next week, I don't think, and this one seems to have enough consensus in the universe that it could function. Obviously, I, I think I, I would suggest that we pass this conceptually as we have all other um, placeholder trailer bill. Um, we understand the trailer bill still needs to be drafted and everybody's going to want to see the detail once it is. Um, but we all <clears throat> also want to put people on a path to what that trailer bill should look like, and I think this vote would allow them to go do that work and hopefully bring such trailer bill language back to everybody by Tuesday or so uh, would be my hope. So if we don't do that, they won't have enough direction to create the trailer bill we need for next week um, to keep things moving. So that would be the recommendation. So call the roll. That's fine. This is a roll call vote. Duchenne? Aye. Dutton? No. Alquist? Aye. Ashburn? DeSalne? Aye. Harmon? Huff? No. Leno? Aye. Lou? Lowenthal? Aye. Maldonado? Negretti McLeod? Aye. Padilla? Aye. Simidian? Aye. Wright? Six, eight. Okay. I, I count eight to two. Is that? Eight, yes, eight to two. Okay, we'll leave the matter on call in case any of the other members do appear, although I think we've pretty much got everybody who's still in town, but there could be somebody. Um, Harmon may come back. I'm not sure quite where he went. Um, all right, so um, eight to two, that um, is the direction of the committee, and we will leave it on call for a moment until we finish. Okay, <clears throat> page six, uh, the emergency response initiative. One more time with feeling. Administration, you want to remind us why we, I don't know. Yeah, the uh, governor's, the governor's budget uh, proposes um, a 4.8% surcharge on uh, residential and commercial property insurance. It will result in the budget year in 200 million in uh, general fund savings through a partial uh, uh, backfill of general fund for CAL FIRE's uh, fire protection program. The reason we are requesting action in the special session is it takes a certain amount of time for the insurance companies to roll this surcharge into the insurance policies. So uh, if the legislature acts now, that will um, achieve what we estimate to be 200 million in general fund savings. Senator Dutton. Sure. <clears throat> now, last year this issue came up as well, and there was a, a ledge council opinion that uh, at that time it was a tax, not a fee. Uh, has anything changed? Uh, the administration still believes it's a fee. Uh, okay. the, the, the rationale is that um, the insurance uh, premiums that well, I understand the rationale. Pay. It's the same okay. as last year, right? It, it, it's the same rationale. Okay. So, what about ledge council? Has ledge council came up with an opinion? Yeah. Senator Dutton, Mark New with the Legislative Analyst Office. That has been the the verbal opinion of ledge council. We have uh, asked ledge council for a formal written opinion, uh, which will be available shortly. But addressing specifically the fee versus tax characterization of the governor's proposal, the fee versus tax characterization of an alternative 
fee on structure, st structural property owners in SRA, <laughs> as well as the Prop 98 funding uh, issue. So, th and that will be shared with all members. But to the best of my knowledge, that's council. When, when might we expect that? That might be helpful. Yes, that will be. Uh, Ledge council just informed me it will be probably early March. But they will just just be providing their their analysis in in writing. But uh, it should confirm what has been uh, their their verbal position over the last uh, number of years on this issue. To my knowledge, it hasn't changed. But but okay. the analysis will be provided. But the analysis that we have, given that special session is likely to be closed before March first. Um, for the moment would be that the governor's proposal is a tax. What did, do you have any verbal or whatever on your structural, that one's yours, the structural fee thing? Is yeah, that one? I, I can certainly Tell comment. me more about that one again. That's the SRA stuff, right? Uh, certainly, and, and it's a proposal that, uh, uh, I mean, our alternative proposal was very similar to what Budget Conference Committee adopted last year of having a, uh, a fee on uh, property owners that have structures in state responsibility areas, which is the uh, um, area of fiscal responsibility for, for CAL FIRE. Uh, there was a, a bill I should note for the legislature in 2008, uh, Senator Keogh introduced a bill, Senate Bill 1617, which uh, pr proposed such a, a, a fee that was not keyed as a tax at that time by uh, by Ledge Council. So, but yours was keyed as a fee, a, a real fee. That, that was that was not yes that was keyed as a as as a fee so our alternative fee structure is is very similar to to that but ledge council what they are going to do in their written opinion uh, is provide sort of the the detailed analysis that really supported okay. that position because it, it seems to be a matter of great interest to members and we want to have that uh, detailed analysis now, now the writing. fee the the structural fee proposal how much I know it wouldn't generate as much as the governor's proposal do you recall or do you have any current figures on ballpark of what um, revenues that might produce well, under the the conference committee's proposal last year, I think that was in the uh, perhaps it was in the, the nature version. of like thirty to fifty million or so. I mean, it's, it's it very much depends less. on uh, the structures we find. Yes, <laughs> uh, I mean it, it's certainly depending on what your per structure fee is. I mean, we and what think we call a structure is every outhouse and every barn and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. On an analytical basis, we think I mean the the, the fee could raise uh, uh, could certainly raise more and potentially as much as the governor's proposal. But that's a, a policy call of the legislature of how much it wants to share the cost of wildland fire protection between the public taxpayer and uh, and the and the, own, the property owners that directly benefit from those services. One concern. Oh, one concern sorry, about. Sorry. The uh, SRA fee, if it were to be enacted, was that it's unlikely that any revenue would be generated uh, in the budget year because it, uh, you would have to do an inventory of all of the structures in SRA, which would be very time consuming. And depending on how the fee is structured, if it uh, was uh, assessed based on uh, risk, fire severity zones, um, a defensive dis uh, a discount for defensive space. A defensible space, then the more complicated it becomes, the more... Um, well, let's just assume we weren't being complicated and, and couldn't we go to the property tax assessor's roles and find out how many structures are on the given parcels? You would have to do a map. Uh, well, I mean, the mapping and the overlay, I believe, of the SRA versus wh where the property is, um, is complicated and you have to do an inventory. Even if you simplify it, it's unlikely you would get any revenue, I believe, in the budget year. Mm, I wondered if we passed it early enough, it would seem to me it wouldn't be any harder to implement than your insurance fee, which would be really complicated and involve lots of players, whereas this would be more a question of can the department, some department somewhere, and the assessor get together and figure out which are the parcels that are within the SRA and and at least for the moment until you get a more thorough survey which you could do and update it how many structures are people paying property tax for within those areas uh, it would seem to me that might kind of get it started. Senator, we certainly have, have, have looked at that, that issue and, and uh, if, if the fee uh, were kept fairly simple and perhaps had some tiering based on level of risk, because you do need that nexus between sort of the risk caused by the property owner and, and the costs imposed on the state, um, the, the risk maps certainly exist and uh, the, while there would be a few months lead time to, uh, to put it together, it certainly is doable to, uh, in our view, to, to get the budget year revenues. Why couldn't it be a flat fee just you're in the area where you're being serviced by the state fire department why would you need to get into the whole risk thing 
I believe that, I mean, that is an issue of, of, of nexus. If yeah, the fee level were kept quite low, that you... Yeah, $10 a... Th there house may be some wiggle room in, in terms of that, but uh, what definitely would would not be a, a fee structure that would pass muster is, is if the if the fee were simply a, uh, a fee per parcel that... Uh, parcel that, tax I got. That yeah, causes that that causes more problem. problematic. That's why the structure fee was an interesting way of approaching it. Senator Dutton? Yeah, CAL FIRE's mission is primarily wildland, correct? Correct. And yet we're trying to impose fees on structure. So that's not part of their mission anyway. And here's the other concern I've got, and maybe we need to take a hard look at this. I know that CDF or, or CAL FIRE does actually contract with various cities and, and counties to provide fire services, but it isn't just fire services. They're also providing paramedic services. Now, that's an important service, but that's not part of their mission. And so I'm also questioning, too, is on these cities and counties that they're providing services to, are they actually uh, charging them the full amount that it's, it's actually cost to provide that level of service? And so I've got, I just have more and more questions starting to open the fairness of this. Most cities that I'm aware of that have uh, newly developing properties and things, they actually cr they pass, f you know, CDF or community facility districts and charge extra money for things like fire support, and so they're already paying that in uh, in areas. So I'm I'm really looking at a fairness issue, and I've also got some serious questions about the actual amount of dollars that's being charged to these very cities and counties for the services they're providing, and it just seems to me if you're gonna go down this path, you better look at changing the mission statement of CAL FIRE. Uh, we would agree that that's uh, some very important concerns about the SRA fee, and that's why the administration is not proposing it. Uh, we would also know that the note that the emergency response initiative, the purpose of it is not just a fire protection uh, benefit. It's to enhance the overall state's emergency, emergency response service. surge capability, and it goes way beyond just the CAL FIRE fire protection. Then wouldn't uh, that be more of a general fund item other than attaching it to individual homeowners? Right, but he never did. The, 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 basis, the basis is is that because you're basing it on risk and insurance premiums, um, that there's a nexus between the likelihood of an emergency response benefiting that particular homeowner, um, and therefore there's, there's a benefit. The person who has the higher risk is paying a higher amount than the person who has the lower risk, and that's why it's a That doesn't have anything to do with search and rescue, though. That's not, that service has nothing to do with whether a home's a greater actually, risk or not. Actually, Cal, uh, search and rescue is one of CAL FIRE's. Um, no, no, I'm missions. talking about, you're talking about what, the, what you're assessing to that individual homeowner, whether they are a higher risk or not, doesn't have anything to do with that service. Well, if they're in, say, an earthquake uh, zone, for is example. Is there any place in California that's not? Well, well I know there's not in Southern California. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you're in an earthquake zone, you're more likely to be subject to an earthquake and therefore more likely to need search and rescue services than... You also have higher insurance requirements and things, too. Well, that's why you'd pay under the governor's proposal. I think what he's trying to tell us is that the, you would pay more because your insurance will cost more and therefore the surcharge will be greater. And therefore, so if you have a bigger property or your more expensive property... I'm not quite sure that equates to risk, but I mean that's the theory is that you're paying more insurance and therefore you must be higher risk and therefore you pay a higher yeah, insurance. Maybe what we really ought to do is we ought to start with the uh, United States Forestry Department and get them to actually do a better job of putting the fire out before it comes down to our area. Well, that maybe would that be would nice. be the better solution. I see or at least get them to pay the money. Might, might want to come. So. <laughs> I see a fireman who might want to comment on your question about the contracts and yeah, such. If you have a moment, I would like yes. to can identify you yourself. Yeah. Can, can Ken Pimlot, Deputy Director, Chief of Fire Protection for CAL FIRE. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, two things I wanted to clarify. Uh, one, uh, while CAL FIRE's primary mission is protection of wildland, or of the state responsibility areas of wildland, well, for wildland fire, through the Public Resources Code, we have the authority to enter into contractual agreements with uh, fire districts, cities, uh, county special districts for all risk emergency services, including fire protection. Uh, we have over 145 of those agreements um, across the state, many of uh, through multiple counties and districts. Uh, what that does is it provides uh, through par it provides paramedics, it provides uh, folks trained in hazardous materials uh, response. 
uh, technical rescue, all of the things that local government is looking for for providing uh, municipal fire services. Those services through these contracts uh, are paid for by local government. Uh, under the state administrative manual, Cal Fire has to uh, fully recover its costs. And we do that through, uh, one, the uh, staff services or the benefit rate that we uh, assess. First of all, they're paying for the full freight of all of the operational costs, O and E. They're also paying for the salaries of those individuals that are they are contracting for for 100% uh, of those salaries. On top of that, all including of including long-term benefit. Yes, term on, benefit? Uh, assessed on top of the the salaries are the, the what we call the staff benefit rates. And as part of that staff benefit rate, we assess all of the retirement costs, health benefit costs, uh, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, uh, all of the things that are associated with uh, those employees' costs, so that we can fully recover that and remit that back to the state. On top of all all of that, the state assesses an administrative charge, which is uh, calculated annually uh, using the Office of Management Budget Circular 87, which is the accepted standard uh, at all levels of government. And within that administrative charge, we, we it's broken out into the state's pro rata, which are the fees that we pay or the costs that are paid back to uh, the uh, Attorney General's office, the state controller's office, all of those indirect kinds of costs that the state uh, incurs for supporting everything that it does, including including administering these contracts. And then on top of that, the other component of the administrative charge is the department's own indirect charge, which covers all of our indirect costs of administering these contracts, our uh, IT, our legal services, labor relations, all of those things that we do. So through that process, uh, we have the formulas and the calculations and the process that fully identifies and recovers all of the costs so that it's cost neutral back to the state, that local government is fully paying for that. So. We have these agreements that really almost 2,000 additional CAL FIRE employees that we receive full reimbursement on that CAL FIRE has full access to. So these individuals are working for local government, we're meeting their mission. However, in times of emergency, whether it's a, a wildland fire, earthquake, uh, flood, all of those folks that are trained, specialty trained in cliff rescue, uh, hazardous materials, they're all available to uh, and are utilized to respond to these types of disasters. And that's not just within the state responsibility area. Good examples have been the Northridge earthquake, uh, the Loma Prieta earthquake. Uh, we've responded with incident command teams, uh, mobile kitchen units, uh, fire engines, hand crews, all of that to support local government within the city of Oakland, wherever it may be. And it's done under the authority of the mission tasking process or the state's emergency plan. Okay. And so even though it's not our direct responsibility, uh, we are mission tasked and do that as part of the state's surge capacity. I had not intended to have a full public hearing, but I see more people. You want to make a comment from the insurance perspective? Is that what I'm, what you're hovering for? Okay, briefly. Um, on behalf of Liberty Mutual Insurance Company and the insurance agents and brokers, um, just wanted to comment quickly. I keep hearing the homeowners. Um, possible cost on homeowners, and I would uh, the great majority of the money that's going to come from this program or from this surcharge will be as a result of the surcharge on commercial properties in the state, um, which will be substantially more than the yeah. That's bigger money that goes back to the risk and the size of the policy and some of those issues. Right. Got it. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. By the so way, I appreciate you all your information. Um, I'm somewhat familiar with it because I come from Ranch Cucamonga and we have contract services. And I understand the logic also know that I don't really think you are getting 100% reimbursement on the cost of that because, but that, 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 that will save for another council. policy discussion. That's because you were on the, the city council. Do, let, me, change, right? let me ask you another question. Do you have a dedicated search and rescue team? But Cal Fire participates as part of the state's uh, urban search and rescue team. So Do you we have, have a dedicated team though? Cal Fire does not. Okay, that's that was my question. And then also, uh, and then that's, that's basically all I have for there. I, this tax, though, is going to go into the general fund to backfill CDF cuts, correct? Uh, this fee is going to be deposited into a um, special fund, and we'll, that special fund will be used to fund, uh, partially fund CAL FIRE's fire protection program, and we will then reduce general fund by 200 million. So, it, so the, does it go to backfill the cuts? It backfills. Th there's no there's no programmatic cut to Cal Fire. The purpose of this is to reduce Cal Fire's general fund by 200 million, 
and then backfill with a special oh, kind I see. of so it's a, it's you a won't have shift. to cut them it's just that it'll you'll be able to increase them without which be able to pay for them we can decrease their general fund by 200 million without cutting them yeah. it's a fund shift yeah it's basically, basically it's a 200 million dollar reduction you're backfilling as far as we're concerned but that's that's okay. that's right we can, that's right that's our opinion okay. okay well i don't i don't know that anybody's proposed the reduction which is a different question the question is what are you going to reduce if you don't have the 200 million dollars available then cal fire might get reduced other people might get reduced you you you, you just don't have enough to move around which goes back to my original point once upon a time it seems so much simpler to me I actually sort of agree with Senator Dutton about the general fund funding fire and it just seems to me that the best source would be to restore the VLF to 2% um, and allow all of these things to be appropriately funded the way you know the VLF used to fund the local fire and local folks and local cops now you know other things are funding those and we need general fund to fund I think emergency services and I think whether it's a net, I mean in the end we should go to the 2% at least on a temporary basis for a couple of years to get through this crisis and then we wouldn't have to be struggling with all these miscellaneous odd new ideas whether they're fees or taxes and I mean I think the governor maybe do you have any legal opinions I mean I think you may have the only lawyers in the state that think this is a fee and not a tax uh, I don't. I mean, I think it was keyed that way last year. The reason it didn't get to the governor last year was because it was keyed as a two-thirds vote. So it, it's been voted on multiple times. It, multiple it was. Uh, it's keyed as a two-thirds vote, as I understand, because of the urgency clause. Mm, no, Ledge Council keyed it as two-thirds because they believe it's a tax. That's what I understood. And although we have passed it by majority vote, I don't know that it's ever received a two-thirds vote, and that's been the. Yeah, I'm just going by issue. what was told to us in the conference committee last year. Is ledge council basically in conference committee last year said it was a tax, so I don't I think know that was that, why it was key two thirds. But just as uh, going back to what you said, actually, I somewhat agree with what you're saying about going back to 1999 and whenever the other things happen, and you also need to include all the other program increases as well as SB 400, and let's also add AB 32 and SB 375 and some of those others with it. So there's a lot of things that have gotten us to this point besides just the vehicle licensing fee so no it's not by itself but I mean it was a it, what all I'm the point I was making it was a it would now although it would not at that time it was not a general fund provider as it were it but but if I provided local government money it now I mean would provide general fund and it could be at the same rate that it was for 50 years and we would have the general fund we need since we've now swapped out property tax to the locals it would provide general fund relief in the old days it provided all that local government money that helped pay Cal Fire from the contracts now property tax does that and and it would be a simpler way of acknowledging a general fund Need. I mean, many of the programs, you're right, from 99, most everything's been cut so much and well, fees and schools and restore, stuff have gone up. Well, we did restore 0.5 or something 0. like 5 that. 0.15, and, so and I'm for that. that anyway, I'm there. So. I just and want I the rest. Still got a problem. So. The, the, but the 0. 0.15 was dedicated to local government again, even though they already got the property tax. So give me the 0. 0.15, give it to Cal Fire, I'm good. But nobody's sort of suggested that yet. I tried that last year a few times and nobody bought it. But I, I just think we got to look at I think it is a general fund obligation to fund fire. And maybe it is too complicated to go through all these other things and come up with specialized taxes and fees that seem somehow directed, related or not. We ought to just acknowledge that we have a responsibility to fund them and then provide the funding to do it. But anyway, all right. There seems to be, let, let's get a little more information and see what we can find out. Um, and we'll put this one over without objection to see if we think about it some more or some alternatives to it and and get a good sense for this I mean if you could do it with majority vote you might have got this last year but so far nobody else believes that except you so see if you can find some lawyer someplace that'll tell us that oh Senator Leno's with you so let's see where we go all right <laughs> Senator Huff uh, would this be an appropriate time to ask about the job impacts on this that we had an industry oh, that's good, representative that's say that it, it's going to be tacked onto commercial properties, right? right? And so is that going that's to fair. encourage job creation or is that going to discourage job creation? I would think it probably puts pressure on job creation, so I just throw that out since we're all concerned about jobs now. And I do agree with the chair that I think this is a general fund obligation. Regardless of where we budget, if there's a fire, we're going to take care of it and we're going to figure out how to pay for it. 
Finance, you want to respond to the question about jobs? Um, I guess what I would say is, is that there's two sides of the ledger that you have to account for. One is the, um, the additional cost of doing business uh, as a result of this insurance surcharge. On the other hand, there are potential cost savings to the extent that the state's surge capacity gets is improved and enhanced. That means that you can get um, additional um, engines and equipment and personnel uh, on the ground to um, ensure that catastrophic fires or uh, damage as a result of floods and earthquakes are minimized, and to the extent that you can minimize those damages, that ends up being a cost savings. So you have to look at both sides of the ledger on that. See what and not to, not to even uh, mention the public safety benefits as well. Okay, well, all right, looking at, at, you know, see what more analysis people can come forward with, and it's a... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's quite there yet, but let's look at your thing again and let's look at a couple of the others and see what else is out there to help support emergency services. All right. We have already voted on the trailer bill uh, for the water resources. We um, have discussed the corrections. Yes, Senator Delano. Sorry. I just want to credit the Department of Finance. That's about as close to a cost-benefit analysis as we've heard today. That's right. We've been trying to get those for a while. I thank them. We've been working on those. Even put it in a little more concrete form, and we'll all be happier. Um, the uh, corrections thing we did discuss, I think, a little more conversation between Senator DeSaulnier and the department may help us get, help them better understand where, where we're, I think we're trying to get everybody to go. Um, and we'll have a little more time um, over this longer weekend, uh, but by Tuesday we need to figure out where we are. I, I, I think our point with that one, I don't know if the corrections are still here, that, that may have gotten lost in our scurry to get out of here, is that there's just not a lot of point in laying off teachers if you're going to hire somebody else. Why would we hire new people and lay off people that are already our employees if those employees could work part-time, half-time, change the system, do whatever you need to do to create the savings without hiring 300 new people to just to lay off a bunch of other people? And the other question I want to answer to somebody out there um, is this one of where they were moving them to. Um, because if there were in fact vacancies that they could that they're moving these teachers into, I do think we need to look at whether the we think those vacancies are as high a priority as maintaining the teaching program. So I, it just I think both of those are questions that are out there, and um, whether we resolve them this week, they will continue to go through the fall year if if we don't. So all right, I think we if I we did vote on the cash management already. Um, do we have, what do we have? Was everybody here or is there a? The 11, okay, the, so both of those were out 11 to zero. Is there anybody else that voted that's here? Let's see, call the absent members just to make sure if we, just so I get back on roll call here. Harmon, <laughs> Lou, Maldonado, Wright. Okay, none of them have been here. So that takes care of everybody. We don't need to leave it on call. Okay. Unless, um, okay, last page, last discussion um, were the proposals with respect to revenue um, acceleration and administration. Um, the most controversial one is the first one up. And we chat a little bit about that one, although I don't know that we'll do better than the uh, uh, than the um, the ERI discussion. Um, all of these proposals, as far as I understand them, let's just start from here, are in fact keyed in such a way, or uh, I mean by ledge council or whoever, as um, majority vote because they are basically enforcement issues, not actually tax increases. Is that everybody's understanding? Just so we start with a slate that we know what, what it is. So everybody's understanding that all of these, one way or the other, um, whether we do them or not, are considered to be tax enforcement measures. 
Just one I'm question. Looking for nods down below. One question relative to all of them. Though. Yes. Senator Has there been any policy hearings on these? Because I know a couple of these look familiar to me, but I don't think they've ever made it out of a policy committee. Oh yeah, no, several of them made it actually all the way to the governor's office so last maybe year. Can, they were in multiple maybe you can, policy hearings. Yeah, maybe you can let us know which ones actually made it out of a policy hearing. Which um, one didn't. The that firm would bill, I believe, the abusive tax shelters. If I'm not mistaken, who's on revenue tax? Senator Alquist. I'm pretty sure all of those made out of policy last year in revenue tax. I think and so the nexus has been through the assembly, if not the Senate. Uh, I, think, well, I think it was Calderon bill last year. All of these had multiple hearings over the last three or four years that I can recall. Several of them have been voted on on the floors, they've been voted on in committees, they've been voted on almost all of them as far as I can remember. How many of them actually made it out of probes and actually got to the governor's day or at least to the floor? I'm sure the firm bill did because I think it went to the governor's. Anybody else remember? I'm sorry, I, I don't have that data with me. I can find somebody. Somebody, um, hold on. Maybe finance or Chris Hill for Department of Finance. Um, <laughs> the firm proposal was discussed in conference committee, but it ultimately wasn't um, included in the package that went to the governor. As it I wasn't. No, there was uh, some concern. I remember voting on it on the floor. I think there was some concern regarding the fact that in conference committee that there was no feasibility study report for the firm program proposal, which is why I believe it was ultimately tabled in conference. But I believe it was an actual bill by Senator Rolk that is that um, we're checking right now with Reverend Tax. Mr. Cohen, do you have different? Sure, uh, Michael Cohen with the LAO. I think Mr. Uh, Hill's uh, recollections from two years ago conference last year. My notes have all of these things sort of were approved at conference, but there also were bill numbers. Um, there were bills with all. The, I, I don't know how far they got on each case. The firm one was SB 402. Um, the independent contractor one, I don't have a bill number on. The, um, was for the shelter one was SB 401. Uh, the license one, AB 478, 484. Um, and then sales tax nexus, AB 178. Okay. Um, yeah, but I don't think they actually ever made it. I, I, my information is they didn't, most of them didn't make it out of a probes, which is curious because if they're somehow increasing revenues, I don't know what happened out of probes. So I still ain't point I was making. So. I, I don't know the, uh, I don't where know. they, they uh, fell off. Um, Senator Alcus remembers voting on them in revenue tax, uh, most of them. Um, I mean, so they have been through policy committees in various forms. I, I had thought they actually got through the floor last year, but. I may have been mistaken on that. I remembered them having bill numbers, so I knew they'd moved in the policy format um, through some level. Um, and they were also discussed in conference, but. And I think the conference report last year conference ha report had ad adopted them all. And adopted they, the trailer. And then they, um, they came out during the um, post-conference negotiations. Oh, okay. All right, that all being heard. Um, the independent contractors, and we talked about this earlier, and I, we heard all of the concerns. I, I, one of the things that's occurred since since the last time we discussed this one, um, a lot of us have been talking about whether there was some threshold or the interaction with the estimated payments made a difference. Since we accelerated estimated payments, one of the issues that's come up is, you know, do you do this on top of that? And that, that seemed a fair argument to some of us. It, it, what's what's the time limit, or what did we do with the estimated payments last year? We've increased estimated payments, or accelerated them, or done something, but you, maybe for some limited period of time. I don't know what it is. The estimated payment schedule that went in as of tax year 2010 is now 40 percent in uh, April, right? 30 percent in June. 30% in December, and that's what they're supposed to do, although in, in practice, people tend to sort of, you know, put off their estimated payments as late as they can. Like under right. the old system, you know it was that. supposed to be 25 in April, 25 in June, 25 September, 25 December. We tended to get, get about a third of the revenue in uh, April and June and two-thirds in September and December. Okay. Yeah, it was a, more of an acceleration issue. And the thing with estimated payments is you're paying on... You know, it's like a futures bet that you, you think you'll get some income or you base it on last year's income. And I, it's been, I've been thinking about the question of whether um, having the withholding would actually be in the interest of somebody whose income may be fluctuating. And 
you'd know more steadily. You'd actually get a payment and then you'd withhold 3% rather than guessing how much you might get a year from now. And if you didn't have the acceleration. The, the vast majority of the estimate, the $1.4 billion is, it, is accelerating payments and it's basically assuming that people aren't going to change their uh, withholding amounts or their estimated payments amounts. So there's an interaction between the two and that ultimately come, is where the sort of the variability on the estimate comes from is just n not knowing how quickly people are going to react and figure out wh what their overall tax liability is and, mm -hmm. and when they make those payments. Have we done any estimates on, on if you didn't have the threshold at $600 and I don't know what the appropriate, it goes back to the cost benefit analysis question. I've heard people concerned about the administrative cost of doing this. I've also heard a lot of people concerned about, um, you know, the very small businesses and that's way more headache than it's worth. <clears throat> the question of whether large payments are the bulk of, you know, in other words, I don't know, contract payments to somebody of several thousand dollars on an individual contract, um, if you withheld on that rather than on everybody at $600. I think this, this, this analysis is at, this number is based on $600, right? Uh, like the federal government, any 1099, so. right? Yeah. So <clears throat> I just, I, I mean, I think there may be variations on the thought that might be less troublesome administratively, might also make some sense from the taxpayer's point of view if you interacted it with the estimated payments differently. Um, I don't know. Anybody else? I mean, you don't like it. What else? Anybody else? <laughs> Comments, thoughts? What else? I already know that part. Senator Leno. I'm, I'm struggling with it a little, but Senator Leno? So I wasn't sure what LAO or finance for that matter was saying with regard to the $1.4 billion estimate that is at the $600 threshold. So do we lose one to $300 million if it is raised to 5000 We don't have the estimates for that. We could we could get those. Um, it would put us out of conformity with the federal government, uh, which does raise additional implementation issues. Uh, this is a big program. Well, do they withhold? The federal government they withholds even at six hundred dollars. No, they don't. They have what's known as backup withholding for taxpayers that do not provide a uh, taxpayer ID or a social security number to the payor. But otherwise, they don't have a direct, regular withholding. They on, don't do that miscellaneous either. Campaigns. So we wouldn't be in conformity, no matter we what. We would not be in conformity with this, no matter yeah. what. Well, that's true. And then that's one other true question. on all other areas too. Yes, Senator Delano. Do we have any way of knowing to what degree this would address the underground economy? Um, there are some other states that have uh, a program like this. Minnesota, for example, has a hmm. withholding, but they do it as a as a tax gap measure. It wasn't as a full budget kind of solution, if you will. And it's it's specifically directed towards the contracting industry and uh, payments that are made to sole proprietors. Under this proposal, um, miscellaneous payments to companies as well as individuals would occur. So you do have this kind of tiering effect which um, raises a, a lot of administrative issues for FTB, uh, and it also gets you into this area where you could have overwithholding, which I, I think you've discussed before. Um, and then if you have overwithholding, you would have refunds coming in, refund requests, and it can be uh, difficult to match up uh, the refund request with an actual withholding amount that took place. I think that's so the, I think the, some of our concerns are both on the, the overwithholding aspect of it, but, uh, but also in terms of the state FISC, uh, making sure that the refunds are legitimate uh, claims. Okay. Thank you. Do, does LAO have an opinion on this as opposed to just, I don't think we're voting on it today. Well, we do, looks of things, we do collect some, uh, you know, pit revenue from people who, uh, you know, their, their employers withhold some taxes for them, but they don't actually file returns. So mm -hmm. we do, you know, capture some revenue through withholding that we otherwise wouldn't collect at all. And so there may be, to some extent, the same thing with uh, contractors. Some of them might not be filing uh, returns. They don't know how big that is, but I mean, that's where the sort of permanent, the estimated permanent increase comes from. Oh, yeah, and the estimated permanent on this was a couple hundred million? Is that one? I think it's 100 is, uh, is the it's last number I saw. Finance, you agree with that? Is that? Yeah, I recall it being about 5% of the total. All right, well, we'll talk to FTB a little more. 
Um, okay, on the firm one, we are advised that um, SB 402 did make it through both Rev and Tax and Approves um, last year, which may be why I recall, it seemed to me we even voted it off the floor. It may be that it went to the Assembly, which is why it didn't go to the Governor, and that's why I'm confused, um, but I don't recall. Um, this is the one, um, but in that form, I believe all of the issues that had been raised in the various other discussions about this had been resolved with respect to the banks and how they might do it and because um, they do it now for child support. This is the one where they do it for child support now, they just don't do it for FTB. And why wouldn't we want to do that in order to enforce? And I believe, if I recall correctly, and the bill hasn't changed, and at least if we were adopting it here, I would want it to be in there, that it would only apply after there was, it would, the privacy issues that came up, that it would only apply um, after there was a settled, if you will, judgment um, that the money is owed. That's the way I remember the bill. Um, so it didn't change tax liability. It does not change uh, your ability to keep your bank records private, except just like in any other debt um, or like a child support debt, the bank can tell FTB or somebody, wh whoever the collection agency is, in this case FTB, that you have money in the bank <laughs> so that they can try to figure out how to go collect it. Um, but they can't request the information from the bank. FTB couldn't unless they had a settled judgment, not just a, I mean a done, done judgment, done, judgment done. Um, so it's a collection um, mechanism that I think FTB has been asking for and I think um, has been worthy of our so consideration. I'm, Senator I'm just Duff. trying to make sure I understand. So you're saying right now if FTB has a judgment already, right. it's been through process, they don't have the ability to go collect? Well, this would help them know if there's money in a bank that they could go then attach and collect because the bank could tell them that somebody has but money. But can't the bank do that anyway if they, I mean, no. they just have to serve the writ or whatever it is. Well, but you know what money. bank to serve it on. Well, you do a you, you How do, do you search. find out that they have an account? Well, they have to have a taxpayer ID number or a social security number to open up an account or something, so you. Right, but how does FTB you do find search. out that you have the bank account they do if the search. bank is not it's, allowed to tell you? It's not that difficult. It's, yeah. I think um, my recollection of how this works is basically just that, that you're, bas you're requiring the financial institutions to, on a quarterly basis, match up a list of um, ID numbers with their, their bank accounts to see if there's a, a match there that, that has assets. But they already have the ability to make the search, so I don't know what the chance, I don't know why. Well, the banks are prohibited from giving you the information, so. No, not if it's not if it's been adjudicated. I mean, it's That's if you've got true. if you've already, if you got the order because you can go you can go and attach somebody's wages for gosh sakes. I mean, that's not that problem. Banks have to let you do it, so I don't. Where they work. Well, <laughs> Denise, Go ahead, I understand FTB. that. But well, um, but that's the same point. <laughs> Lisa no, Garrison not. with the uh, Franchise Tax Board. Um, actually, at the point we would use this tool is is that a person um, would have had showing that they owe additional tax, they would have had all administrative remedies. Now, the term you have used is there would be a judgment. Normally, I think that's kind of a, a specific term in the fact that you would go to court to get the judgment. That is not what is, is contemplated here. What it is, though, they have had their administrative, their remedies, they could have contested it. Now it is a collection account. Um, basically, as the chair pointed out, we don't know where an individual would have a checking account. With a, with a type of savings account, we might have information from 1099 reporting where we could do a match and identify where a savings account is. But we, because we have no records internally of where an individual has their savings account or a non-interest bearing account, we don't know what bank to serve. So what this proposal does is one of, it offers one of two options. Either the bank can match directly, they can actually send us a file and that file could be matched against our own records for existing accounts. Or there's another way to do it as well where the bank wouldn't have to give us all their records. They then would, we would do an extract for them and they would match ours against their records so that that's the privacy concern that would be addressed. And it would identify that there was an account there and then we would go and pursue through our normal methods of earnings withholding orders or, or orders um, to withhold. We would then serve that process on the bank to take money out of the account. 
All right, if you've got an obligation and so forth, basically you're gonna go ahead and file some kind of lien that's gonna go out and it'll be tracked to all real property and everything else. Yes. Federal government does the same thing. Yes. Okay, and what you're telling me right now is that you don't have any capability of any kind of record search that's already existing that you can go track somebody's taxpayer ID number or, or uh, social security number and be able to flag where they currently have assets. Not a checking account type or a non-interest bearing account. There, no, there is no, there is no public record out there or record that we have access to, nor that the IRS has access to, that allows that allows us to identify what bank. Um, the, I mean, if you if you owe, if you had a tax liability, we would have no way of knowing that you had a account at Bank of America, unless let's say if you had a savings account, they would have issued you a 1099. And then we would have had, through that information, we would know you have a savings account. But if it's a non-interest bearing account, no, we, we don't have it and neither does the IRS. That's yeah, why this- well, I find it hard to believe, but then also too, you could put an attachment on, on the, uh, you can put an attachment on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the accounts though, and you can just send a blanket one out based on signers. When we send- If I can do that, if I'm suing somebody, I can do that now. Okay, I can actually take somebody, I can send the Bank of America, whoever, and I can, I can, if the court grant it, I can get an attachment and freeze their accounts. As long as you know they have no, an account I, there. No, I don't need to have the account number. The only thing I need to do is serve them saying, if you've got any accounts with this person, you are here by order to freeze it. That's what you do. So I, I'm just, it just seems to me there's more to this, and I just, I'm, you know, I'll stop asking questions, though. My, my understanding from when I used to try to collect such debts was that, the bank will not accept it as just sort of this blanket thing. You have to actually kind of know what you're going after. It doesn't have to be a specific account, but you got to know that person has something at that bank, or the bank's got to have the ability to tell you. So I think that's what FTB is asking for. I think she's made a good case for it. Um, the recommendation is to um, adopt it. Why don't you call the roll? Oops, we're going to lose a couple of people, but yeah. Senator Leno moves that we adopt. Quick um, question. Yes. Is, are there any other states that do this? Franchise tax board probably is the best uh, one. Yes, there are. Excuse me. Yes, there are. Um, well, first of all, basically, this is done um, on the area of child support debts. It is something that is put in place by the federal government. That is a court order. Well, just this would be but, a but I mean, as far as the process that is pursued is, is that that the um, federal government put it in place and required the states that were involved with the various child support systems who get reimbursed from the federal to put this process in place. So as far as, as a testing of how it works and how it would be administered, it would be administered um, just like that program that is used. We currently, in fact, use the, that program as part of our child support a collection system here in California. So we and, 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 and a significant number of other states, for that purpose, use this process. But this for point. this purpose, do other states use this process? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody got the list quickly? Because yeah, we need James to move on Dr. before I lose Alabama. everybody. Uh, Kentucky, Maryland, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Indiana, New York, and New Jersey are listed here in the uh, FTB analysis. Okay. Okay, that said, may we call, Senator Leno moves that we adopt this proposal. <laughs> call the roll. Which, which proposal I uh, the firm proposal, the banks. <laughs> Bank match record similar to child support. Duchenne? Aye. Dutton? No. Alquist? Aye. Ashburn? DeSalne? Harmon? Huff? No. Leno? Aye. Lou? Lowenthal? Aye. Maldonado? Negretti McLeod? Negretti McLeod, aye. Padilla? Simidian? Aye. Right. Four, six, six Turn, to two. It's okay. called. Okay. Just, aye. Seven to two. We will try to track down Senator Padilla and who else? 
Who else is missing? Lowen, no, Lowenthal's on. Okay, it's Padilla. Senator Padilla is the one that's disappeared, but we'll find him. Okay. Um, the next one uh, was a similar um, legislation that went um, through both houses, is on the assembly floor at the mo went through this house policy and approves and floor. Last I checked was on the assembly floor, I am advised. Um, and uh, again, discourages tax avoidance. Elio, did you, you want to describe this very briefly? You can, if you might. Uh, sure. Very briefly. Um, We're trying to get everybody out of here before three. So this discourages tax avoidance um, and the use of abusive tax shelters by, by creating a consistent definition of, of tax shelters. Is that Seems reasonable. All right, that's short and to the point. Senator Delano moves. Anybody want to discuss this one to death? It only gets us a few bucks, but we'll take what we can get. If you're taking away somebody's ability to make a livelihood, how are they supposed to be able to pay off the taxes? Oh, this is a different. Th this is no. not that one. Oh, we're on a different one. This is the one about abusive tax Never shelters mind, then. and definitions of tax shelters. Madam Chair, do have one question. I, if, if abusive tax shelters are their livelihood, we want them to be gone. <laughs> Yeah, offshore folks, we're not quite sure we care. Senator Leno. Thank you. Um, finance. Have we seen wildly grand variances in estimates of, of the benefit to this? I've seen double digit benefits. Have you seen different analyses? I, I don't know. I've seen different. Fra Franchise Tax Board, do you, are you familiar with this Maybe one? LAO. The ABC. No. The SB 401, 402, 401. I guess another way to phrase the question is, why is it only $2 million? Yeah, it seems like it would be more. No, I Oh, all I can say is uh, you are correct that at conference committee last year, the estimate was 10 to 15, and now it's two. I don't have the rationale for uh, why that was lowered, though. Is this two for the current year, and maybe it's 10 to 15 for the budget? I'm assuming that's the budget year. Well, this uh, is the budget year. But uh, we've got someone whispering over here, so. We like whispers. <laughs> the spring is good. <laughs> Madam Chair, yes. my understanding is, thanks to my colleague, uh, is yes. um, there were some additional provisions in the bill last year that, uh, uh, seven additional provisions. Uh, so this is just on the, uh, as uh, Your pared down version. This is just the definitional and. Just the definitions. Uh, there's. And it clarifies some of the um, some of the statute uh, limitations and the definitions of penalties for FTB purposes. That's why the to help them be able to, yeah. Okay, clarifying definitions is really what this is about to give a. Uh, so it's not a huge um, dollar amount, but it, it might make FTB's life a little easier with their three-day furlough people who don't have any time to do their work anymore. <laughs> All right. Never miss a chance. Thank you. Okay. It, it is on the assembly floor. It's been through this house twice. But nope, it's on the assembly floor. Okay, that said, Senator Leno moves that we adopt this as trailer bill language, just this portion of it. If the bill had other more things, that could continue to go a different way. Um, but this would at least allow FTB to start to change those definitions in time for the budget year. Um, hopefully in a way that would prevent people from abusing our tax system further. Call the roll. Ducheney? Aye. Dutton? No. Alquist? Aye. Ashburn? DeSalne? Aye. Harmon? Huff? No. Leno? Aye. Lou? Lowenthal? Aye. Maldonado? Negretti McLeod? Padilla? Aye. Simidian? Stop. Okay. Six, that eight, measure has eight, eight to, to two. two. Yes. We'll leave it on call just briefly in case I don't know if anybody else is around. Go back to firm and get Padilla. Oh. Um, do you want to lift the call on the previous item? Yes. Thank you. Um, just so we're done. Ashburn, Harmon, Lou, Maldonado, Padilla. Right. Eight okay. to two. That's eight to two. So that is adopted and on call. Now we're at the one that um, Senator Huff was asking about, which is the revocation of licenses. Um, is this one, Fine Tax Tax Board, was this one of your ideas or? 
Right, where is it? I don't know. LAO, somebody's. I'm just asking. I don't know. Isn't this also what you do for child support, though? I mean, I, I have the same concern. I mean, it, it is a legitimate concern that how does somebody earn their living if you're stopping them from earning their living. But on the other hand, I think we already do this for child support as well. No? I'm not sure on the child support. I think the answer to the um, sort of how does someone make a living is that you're, you're kind of to the end of the process and that uh, this is one of the last tools uh, that FTB would turn to if uh, if none of the other options in terms of coming up with a payment plan uh, and those co kinds of things have uh, have, have worked. Well, I think I think the concept on this was, or at least the way the language was drafted, was as long as they show up and then they agree to make payments, then they, they don't take their license. The problem is people who just sort of disappear on you. How do you get their attention, I think, was the point of this one. Is there an appeal process that they can go through if you yank their license and they determine that you weren't allowing them to all other re, you know, avenues? Or is this the final draw and there is no appeal, right? Well, actually, um, no. Lisa Garrison with the Franchise yes. Tax Board, through this process, actually, is we're trying to have that appeal process before their license is actually yanked. And it, the, because, I mean, I'm not sure you're going to believe me, but we share your concern. If we put somebody out of business, we're not going to collect their money. We are very aware of that. The I, idea here is is that, unfortunately, a large there are a portion of people who, frankly, will not respond to us or even talk to us about payment plans or um, uh, unless you get to some sort of point where you are looking at taking property or, or, or having this. So the process basically is they have a whole series of um, four notices where liens are, re are recorded and such before then you begin to get into this process. They are notified under this process and there's actually a 60 day period preliminary suspension notice where before this is suspended. I mean, all this is what's going on to say, come in, talk to us before we suspend your your license, so we can get into a dialogue of what's. Now, is this after the you've actually made your decision? They've actually, if they wanted to, could have appealed to the BOE. Yes. And they've already gone through their appeal to the BOE, and that's it, right? I mean, yes. So you're doing this after they've exhausted that that uh, that avenue as well. Yes. The, what what starts this process what's, is what's called a notice of state income tax due. That is the first final notice after the B of E process is finished or after um, the court process is finished. So they get that first. They get a final notice before levy, which comes from 30 to 60 days after that. Then they get an order to withhold that's issued to the individual's bank if it's available. Then they get a, a notice of state tax lien if there's any property out there. And it's after all those steps we are then going to, to say, okay, here is a 60-day preliminary suspension notice that we would work with the contractor state license. Now, what locks it in so that what you're describing to me sounds reasonable, can that be changed and under what, what authority? That your, your protocol there, your procedure. Can you make that, can the Franchise Tax Board just make the change in their procedure? Could they then go back and say, or is there something specifically the legislature saying you cannot do this until after you've exhausted these others? Since I, I mean, we don't have a bill in front of us today, so I can respond to what's in, in what, what I believe was in the language last year. And yes, okay. that was spelled out in the language of the statute itself. It wasn't something that we could go through and change. Okay. As we go through that, that, that hearing process, one of the things we look for is a financial hardship hearing as well. The mm. idea that we would have a hearing upon the request of the license holder or the debtor that talks about are they, would they experience financial hardship as a result of suspension? So again, okay. this, this talks about- Well, I think I'll go ahead, I'm gonna go ahead and vote no for now, but you know, when we get the language and stuff, I may change my mind, so. I'd like you to look at AB 484, and, and the notion here would be to adopt basically AB 484 as trailer bill, and if we need amendments to that trailer bill, we should decide what they might be, but. But well, I'm um, just concerned it's gonna increase our population in our prison system, because eventually it could cause that them could to be want a big to do problem. other avenues to try to settle up this debt, so I'm just kidding. No, we do not yet have debtor's prison. We can't afford it. Um, but, but the problem is folks who try to skate their income, and they don't put the bank account, and they don't do this, and the one thing they have 
is they're lawyers or dentists or doctors or pharmacists or something, and the state, one other tool the state could have would be to say, <coughs> excuse me, but if you're not recording any income from your business, <coughs> not paying your state tax liability, I mean, that, that's the point. So, <coughs> all right, on that basis, Senator Leno moves that we um, adopt <coughs> this notion as trailer bill language. Call the roll. Duchaney? Aye. Dutton? No. Alquist? Aye. Ashburn? DeSalne? Aye. Harmon? Huff? No. Leno? Aye. Lou? Lowenthal? Aye. Maldonado? Negretti McLeod? <coughs> Padilla? Aye. Semidian? Aye. Wright? Eight to two. That measure has um, sufficient votes, but we will leave it on call temporarily. Okay, one last one. We had Ferret's discussion about this in the public um, testimony hearing the other day. This is the question of people, out-of-state sellers, um, and and trying to establish a nexus uh, to get around, you know, the problem that the federal court so far has has caused for us in this. Um, LAO, you want to get any? comment on this one. Uh, hello, yes, this is Lori Sue at the LAO. Um, yeah, this bill, um, this proposal um, um, amends the law to specify that retailer engaged in business in the state to include um, a retailer that contracts with um, a California resident for um, sales referrals and that such retailer is um, required to pay taxes if the, the gross receipts exceed $10,000 for the four preceding quarters. Is your understanding that this is substantially similar to the legislation that has passed in New York and has been affirmed by that court? Well, all right, the non-witness out there says yes. But, That's my understanding, okay. although I, I believe the New York law is still on, on, on appeal. On appeal, but it won the first round. That's right. That's last time I checked, right? They won, they won in the trial court, they are on appeal. That's, That's correct. Right? So, but the fact that it survived the first test gives me hope to want to reinforce New York in their efforts to um, help all of us get to where we need to get with these companies. So, I support this just in general as a message that people need to start to be serious about. NCSL for 10 years we've been trying to get streamlined sales tax or some other way of dealing with this. If folks won't do it, New York took the you know, took took the bull by the horns, as it were, and tried to find another way to get that dialogue going again. I, and I understand they've been collecting their money uh, while they've been in court, and if we could do that, that would be wonderful. This is money owed. Um, it's just a matter of who gets to collect it. All right. Anybody? Senator Padilla moves um, that we adopt this proposal in the special session. Call roll. Duchaney? Aye. Dutton? No. Alquist? Aye. Ashburn? DeSalne? Aye. Harmon? Huff? Leno? Aye. Lou? Lowenthal? Aye. Maldonado? Negretti McLeod? Aye. Padilla? Aye. Simidian? Aye. Wright? No, Eight, two. Okay, thank you very much, members, for your patience today and coming twice. Um, I do believe, I, are we noticed upon call next week? What are we? Oh, we're noticed. 2.30 or upon adjournment of session. Okay. We are noticed for next Tuesday, members, at 2.30 or upon adjournment of session. Uh, we'll let everybody know as we try to finish up this calendar, bring back the issues that have needed more work. Hopefully we'll have all of the trailer bill language by Tuesday when we come back that we've been talking about and we, so people can actually look at language. Um, and we are hopeful to conclude, um, and, and we're still waiting on, on gas tax language and some of those issues. So. 
we're hopeful to get the remaining issues um, out Tuesday, the latest Wednesday. We really want to try to um, get all of this special session closed before the 22nd. So um, that will be our continuing goal. Appreciate everybody's work and patience. Um, I will um, leave the roll open for about five minutes in case anybody else is still in the building that's a member of this committee that needs to add on to anything um, other than that. Um, thank you all very much. So I'll just, about five more minutes, we'll leave the roll open. That's fine. All right. Uh, I was, I just was. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I think five minutes have gone by. 
all the measures um, had sufficient votes uh, and therefore it appearing that no other member is appearing, um, we will adjourn the hearing. Thank you very much. We'll be back on Tuesday.